From the nation's capital, Washington debates for the 70s. A series of programs designed to bring together for an open exchange of views and opinions, outstanding authorities on vital issues facing the world of the 70s. The topic, indexing and inflation. What is meant by indexing? How much indexing is there already in the American economy? Will indexing help in bringing inflation under control, or will it aggravate inflation? Now, here is Peter Haggis. For most Americans, regardless of their economic status, inflation has become the number one problem. It has also become the number one domestic policy problem for the government of the United States, which has been trying to find solutions. Among other remedies that were tried, there were attempts to regulate wages and prices, so neither would go up dramatically. Economic controls, however, turned out to be highly unsuccessful, and they did not solve the inflation problem. In fact, by the end of controls in April 1974, the nation was headed for an even worse round of inflation. In recent months, several prominent economists have been proposing a different solution called indexation or indexing. Under this plan, a number of economic items would be linked directly to the ups and possibly to the downs of the cost of living index. Under indexation, as prices rise, so do such things as wages, taxes, interest payments, pensions, and the like. A system of indexing has been in use in some segments of the economy for several years now. The incomes of millions of Americans are already tied to fluctuations of the consumer price index. When it goes up, those workers' incomes rise automatically. But there are some built-in problems which can make indexing a mixed blessing, especially over the long haul. Welcome to another program presented by the American Enterprise Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan research and education organization. Our guests on today's roundtable discussion panel are four well-known economists who will express themselves on the topic indexation and inflation. Professor Milton Friedman of the University of Chicago. Dr. Friedman holds the Paul Snowden Russell Distinguished Service Professor of Economics Chair at Chicago. Professor Friedman has devoted a distinguished career to the study of economics and is one of the world's leading authorities on money. Dr. Friedman is the author of many works, including A Monetary History of the United States, considered a definitive effort in its field. Dr. Charles Walker served as the second highest official of the U.S. Treasury Department, Deputy Secretary during the Nixon administration. He has been a banker, served as an official of the Federal Reserve System, and served for eight years as Executive Vice President of the American Bankers Association. Currently, Dr. Walker heads his own Washington-based consulting firm. Dr. William Fellner is a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors and a consultant to the Treasury Department. He was born in Hungary, but has been a U.S. citizen since 1944. Dr. Fellner is an expert in productivity trends, inflation, and unemployment, among other economic areas, which he has taught at the University of California, Berkeley, and at Yale University. Professor Robert J. Gordon teaches economics at Northwestern University. Dr. Gordon has also taught economics at Harvard and at the University of Chicago. He serves as a consultant to the U.S. Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve Board, and is an advisor on economic matters to the Brookings Institution. To conduct our roundtable discussion, Ms. Eileen Shanahan, a veteran Washington reporter for the New York Times. Ms. Shanahan has also been a Washington reporter for the Journal of Commerce. She served as special assistant to the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury and has been an editor at the Research Institute of America. Ms. Shanahan's special area of concentration in Washington has been taxes, controls, and other aspects of the economics field. Now, to begin our program, Ms. Eileen Shanahan. Good evening. I'm Eileen Shanahan with the New York Times. Tonight, we're going to discuss a subject that is so new, there isn't even any complete agreement as to its name. It's sometimes called indexing, sometimes called indexation, and many people may be familiar with it by an earlier name for at least an aspect of it, escalation. No, not war. Economic matters, prices, wages, payments. We all remember, I think, when 
In modern times, at least, the first escalation clause was written into a labor contract right after World War II, the United Auto Workers. And it was based on the idea that if prices were going to go up, wages ought to go up in some direct connection to the amount. Now, a proposal has been made, or rather revived, I'm told by the experts, that indexing be made more general than that. We have here to talk about it a number four distinguished economists, one of whom is currently the most prominent advocate of adoption of escalation, indexation, in a certain form. I think you will find there's disagreement not only about the overall wisdom of the policy, but over how widely it should be applied, what should be left in, what should be left out. Because the subject is so new, we're going to de depart from our usual format, and I'm actually going to ask each of the panelists to give me a three-minute opening statement to define what it is we're talking about, what we agree and disagree on. And I mean three minutes. I brought that useful little tool, my kitchen timer. And I'm about to set it for Professor Milton Friedman of the University of Chicago, who is perhaps at the moment the most noted advocate of indexation. Three minutes, you're on. Indexation may appear new in the United States because we have been so fortunate as to have relatively stable prices except for wartime over the past century and a half. But indexation is a very old idea that goes back centuries and that has arisen into prominence whenever a country has gone through periods of rapid inflation or rapid deflation. Indexation is a scheme or plan, a design, whereby contracts which are made which have a time duration instead of being expressed simply in dollars, are in expressed in dollars adjusted for the rate of inflation. The escalator clauses in wage contracts are of this form. In these cases, a wage agreement is made for three years with the proviso that if prices rise during that period or more or less rapidly, wages will be adjusted accordingly. In the same way, an adjustment for inflation can be made in contracts for mortgages on house, houses, on loans. Uh, an adjustment for indexing is badly needed in the United States to adjust the income tax because under current circumstances, rises in prices by pushing people up into higher income brackets cause the tax load on them to be heavier than was intended by Congress. In fact, because of such automatic effects of price inflation, the United States government last year realized something over $25 billion in the form of tax revenues which were never legislated by Congress on anybody. I am strongly in favor of indexation for two reasons. First, I would like to see legislated indexing of governmental contracts in order to make the government honest, in order to eliminate taxation without representation, in order to make it possible to sell government bonds without conducting a bucket shop operation. Second, I am in favor of voluntary indexing on the part of business enterprises and people engaging in contracts over a period of time in order to ease the withdrawal pains from our present high level of inflation. Indexing per se will not, in my opinion, do anything to reduce inflation. But what it will do will be to make it easier to terminate our inflation. It will make it easier by, making, by reducing the incentive for government to inflate and by making the withdrawal pains from inflation less severe. You hit it right on the nose. That's just about to go off. Now, an opponent of the whole idea, Dr. Charles Walker, former Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, now an economic consultant in Washington. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Shanahan. I uh, disagree very much with my friend, Dr. Friedman, I do not think that he has the right answer for the big problem at this particular time. I'm very grateful for him, uh, to him for uh, the article that he has in this month's uh, recent Fortune magazine uh, on this issue. It goes back to the old statement of, oh, that my enemy would write a book because uh, 
studying his arguments for indexing uh, gave me some thoughts as to how I might respond. As a matter of fact, Professor Friedman's first sentence in this article in the uh, July Fortune reads as follows, the real obstacles to ending inflation are political, not economic. I agree with that very strongly. And I think that many of the things that he says in this article and has said in the last few minutes and will say tonight make a great deal of economic sense. But since he has said that this is basically a political problem, <clears throat> it seems to me it has to be approached in political terms. And I think that indexing is not only politically unnecessary, but uh, can be politically damaging through the economic process for a variety of reasons. The question that the professor raised, Professor Friedman raised, with respect to the government being honest or dishonest in terms of its offering of fixed-term securities to the public, I won't say rubs me the wrong way, but it does raise questions in my mind. I think we do have a representative government and a democratic system of government, and when we talk about whether the government is straightforward or not, we're really talking about whether the uh, people of this country are exercising their role as citizens and voters in the, in, in the proper way. So my fundamental points tonight will be on the political side, although I do have a point or two, Ms. Shanahan, to make on the economic side as the argument goes along. Thank you. Our next speaker is a supporter of the idea of indexing, Dr. Robert Gordon of Northwestern University. I think it's uh, wise to set the tone of the discussion if we go back to the very beginning and ask why it is at the present time that most people in the press and in popular discussions and everyday people in reacting to their own life find inflation so difficult to live with. I've always wondered about the problem, why inflation is considered to be so bad, uh, because if you think about it, what is the difference between one state of the world with constant wages and constant prices and another state of the world with all wages going up at 5% a year and all prices going up at 5% a year? Now, if we contrast this ideal comparison with what's actually happened in the United States in the last two years, we get an idea of what the argument is all about. Of course, in the United States in the last two years, we have not experienced this ideal escalation of prices and wages together. And various representatives of society could step out right now and tell us they have not gained while inflation has been going ahead. With prices going up, particularly due to the increase in food costs and oil prices, we have not had any acceleration at all until very recently in the average wa wage increase. So that the income people have to spend after adjusting for inflation has been going down. In the same way, those people who have been saving for their retirement, for the education of their children, and for the proverbial rainy day have found that the value of their savings accounts adjusted for inflation has been going down as well. What inflation has been doing has been redistributing economic benefits from one group in society to another. There are some gainers, for instance, the farmers, for instance, those people who were lucky enough to get a mortgage negotiated at 5 or 6% interest 10 years ago. Those people are gaining while other people are losing. Now, what can we do about this? The basic argument in favor of indexing is it's fair play. It makes the real world more like my ideal world. Instead of having some gainers and some losers, we bring everybody together by raising the value of savings accounts, wages, and other contracts together in line with the price level. And so we take away this redistribution of income. The people who gained because they got cheap mortgages 10 years ago would have the value of those mortgage obligations go up. And at the same time, the losers, those people who invested in savings accounts, which are now paying interest rates actually lower than the rate of inflation, would gain because those savings accounts would go up with the price level. Very good. Our final speaker <clears throat> describes himself as an opponent, but not an all-out opponent, of indexing is 
a former professor at Yale University and now a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, Dr. William Fellner. Well, uh, Ms. Shannon, I think uh, the inflationary process in this country and in most others has, uh, in recent times, had the characteristic that it kept uh, the level of activity in these economies the degree of resource utilization uh, higher than at a sustainable rate. And that uh, it had the effect that a very large number of uh, decision makers in the market sector um, have expected to earn larger real incomes than they actually turned out to have earned, and this is what stimulated economic activity and raised it to a level that, uh, in the longer run, has been unsustainable. Now, uh, governments uh, under strong political pressure have accommodated this process for quite some time, and then in each round, it turned out that uh, the bulk of the decision makers has earned uh, lower real incomes than were expected, then they were trying harder in terms of money incomes, and uh, the governments accommodated this for fear of causing a recession or even a slowdown of economic activity. Now, while this phase of an inflationary process is developing, I think that indexation would have harmful consequences because uh, the amount of inflation and acceleration of inflation which would have to be accommodated by these governments that accommodated for fear of a recession would be more acceleration and more inflation. Now, uh, subsequently, uh, governments usually have to shift to monetary restraint because this is an explosive process that cannot be sustained for very long, or at least not indefinitely. Then for a while, and this is the second phase of the process, uh, prices still rise steeply, markets weaken, and uh, consequently uh, the shifting of uh, previous cost increases to the buyers takes place in an environment that is described by cooler, weaker, uh, weaker economic environment. And finally comes the third phase, if the governments are credible and if the governments are consistent in this policy of restraint, in which prices decelerate. Now, I think that in the first two phases, not only in the first phase, but also in the second phase of the process which I was describing, indexation would increase the difficulties faced by policymakers. In the third phase, it would help, but on the other hand, in the third phase might easily become postponed by the same policymakers if you invent a device by which you can live with inflation somewhat longer. Then the day of reckoning becomes postponed and the day of reckoning might then become also darker. I do agree with much that Professor Friedman said about Tax, about the tax structure, that needs to be adjusted periodically if prices are rising for the reasons which he pointed out and also because depreciation allowances get to be insufficient. Noted economists, obviously, differ sharply on whether escalator clauses really help fight inflation. Indexing might be a useful tool, they seem to agree, in an economy that's slowing down. But as a permanent device in a continually broadening economic situation, Indexing has some clear dangers. Now, to challenge our economics roundtable speakers, let's go to our panel of experts. Murray Widenbaum, a former Treasury official, if he doesn't mind my saying so, and a professor at the University of Washington in St. Louis. I'm not going to recognize everybody, but I recognize him. Uh, thank you, Ms. Shanahan. I have a question for Dr. Walker. Would he address himself to the point that Milton Friedman has been uh, making in the course of the evening? And that is, so much of the pressure for inflation comes from government itself anxious to generate more revenue. What empirical evidence do you have to support in your dealings with the Congress to support that point? Well, Dr. Wiedenbaum, I uh, 
I think this is not only a very good question, I think in one sense it is the gut question. I've been associated with the federal government, well, not as long as Dr. Friedman. She went <laughs> back to speech writing in 1942 when I was not speech writing. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in my experience with the federal government over a period of 15 or 20 years to try to put in explicit terms any group, whether it was the Congress, or people in the Congress, or people in the executive branch, or the Federal Reserve, to sit down and say, and this is uh, pointing, uh, painting with a pretty broad caricature here, say, but to sit down and say, okay, fellows, how much are we going to inflate this week or next week or next year? Well, that's too broad to say it that way. But obviously, with the pressures for spending that you have, there are all sorts of scrambling of ways to finance that spending, and through that process, I think you'll get some of the things that Professor Friedman is worried about. And I would try to attack that through an education process of informing the public of what the trade-offs are on, for example, cutting taxes this year, what it might mean in terms of inflation next year, additional spending, or what else. In particular, I find it very difficult to believe that the Federal Reserve authorities, at least semi-insulated from inflationary pressures, sit down and say, well, boys, how much are we going to inflate the currency this week in terms of or for the purpose of making the government serve these goals and motives? No, but both of I these expect somebody will respond to Yeah, that. but both of these agencies, both the congressmen, and the members of the Federal Reserve Board deciding how much money is going to be created are not advocating a positive, deciding how much inflation there is going to be. They're fighting a negative. How can we prevent unemployment? What is the least right. money increase we can get away with? And the congressmen are saying, how can we avoid a tax increase? They're going to spend as much as they can possibly spend, stopping short at that point where a tax increase would be necessary to finance it. And by indexing, we're taking away the automatic, painless source of revenue they get, which is now allowing them, painlessly, to go further than they should. But, that's but it's, not not painless, it's not painless now because of painless all of the them. trouble they're going through. Why don't you rather devote your resources to reducing the social and political costs of rising unemployment in a period of slow economic growth? There are because lots of ways to do it. The easiest way to do it is to reduce the amount of unemployment. But, to go, but really to answer Dr. Weidenbaum's uh, statement, I agree with uh, uh, Dr. Walker that no government official ever sits around and pulls a number out of the mm -hmm. hat about how much inflation he's going to cause. Of course not. The causing of inflation is an indirect consequence of these pressures, on the one hand for exp to raise expenditures, on the other hand not to impose taxes. But when I hear Dr. Walker's answer, that the thing to do is to educate the public and to have more responsibility for expenditures and so on. I feel this is where I came in. In 1952, over 20 odd years ago, the Joint Economic Committee of the uh, Congress had hearings on this subject. And one of the proposals that was then under discussion was whether to have a purchasing power bond. And the Treasury officials came in and said exactly what Dr. Walker is saying. And they are say, said, just trust us, we're going to be responsible. That the U.S. government is going to follow a non-inflationary path. Now, doesn't there come a time when you say that instead of depending on that kind of rhetoric, we ought to establish institutions which make it impossible for these indirect forces to produce inflation? If there isn't another question, questioner standing up, I have a question. Dr. Friedman, you said earlier in the program that inflation is only made in Washington. I think most of us understand that inflation is often or largely made in Washington through government spending and taxing policies that are wrong. I think many of us also have the impression that the current inflation, uh, beyond all others we remember in history, is not made in Washington. It was made in a worldwide uh, crop failure in 72 in the Arab cartel and in a number of other ways. Not I at all. Think. In any event, my question is, if you won't concede it, maybe little? somebody else will. <laughs> to the extent that inflation is not fed by bad government tax and budget policies, what good does indexation do you? Well, let me say an answer to that first, because I really don't want to get diverted from the main task. But if you go back and look at the history 
of the proposals for indexation, they were all made historically from 1707 to 1807 to the 1880s and 90s under circumstances when people did not believe that government was responsible for inflation and when under some circumstances it wasn't. Mm -hmm. They were made under circumstances when it was thought that inflation came from gold discoveries or from increasing business that reduced uh, the amount of gold per unit of output. And why were they made at that time? They were made at that time because it was believed by such great economists as uh, Jevons, as Alfred Marshall, as Irving Fisher in this country, it was believed by them that a system in which you had indexed contracts would enable the economy to adjust better to these unanticipated fluctuations in prices. The crucial thing is the word unanticipated. If you haven't anticipated inflation, if everybody knows that every price is going to go up by 10% per year, indexing is of no point or no value. It's great value is to avoid unanticipated events, unanticipated inflation, so that really the argument for no, indexing no, 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 wait. doesn't yeah, depend on you don't confused. avoid the unanticipated inflation. No, no, you're inflation. right. You, you avoid it the helps effects. people reduce the pain right. from the crop failure from the Arab right. cartel. Now, there yes. are two, th two different points to distinguish here. I don't think we should get into a debate about how much of the recent inflation was caused by oil and the Arabs and how much was caused here in Washington. But the important point gets back to my original statement that the fundamental argument for indexing is fairness and equity. And what we've had is a redistribution of income to the farmer, away from the small saver, and the indexing is designed to alleviate the pain that comes when we have this fortuitous circumstance. Now, the increase in the price of oil isn't going to continue forever. And when the, if we had had indexing during the last two years, we would have had more inflation and more wage increases during the period when people were being insulated from this unforeseen pain, but after it was over and it was not going to be permanent, the, the wage increases would have come down. They would have been slower than otherwise. So you would have had more of a cycle, but people would have had less harm over the process. Yes, but I'm very confused by what something Dr. Friedman said, if I understood him correctly, that indexing really makes sense only to con cope with conditions of unanticipated inflation did you say that? Mm -hmm. Whereas your recent article in Fortune and your advocation or advocacy of indexing right now is based upon the fact that we are facing the greatest fear of inflation and prospects for inflation in many, many oh, years. I that see. seems to me contradictory. Not at all. It's a question of quality versus quantity. When I say unanticipated inflation, I mean unanticipated amount of inflation. Everybody around is concerned in anticipating inflation. Well, how much but is a lot? But you tell me, how much is a lot? How much yeah. inflation are we going to have? Is it going to be 6% next year, 10%, 3%? And the case for indexing is strongest when you have great uncertainty about the degree of inflation that you will have. And why weren't you for it 10 years ago? I was. Indexation? Indexing? Yeah. In 1952, in power bonds, I know right. that, but I'm okay. talking about Oh, <laughs> in a world in, in which... In 42, because, you were No, no, but 10 years ago, when you had very little inflation, when you had fairly stable prices, in a world of stable prices, I am not in favor of indexation. I am in favor of indexation of government contracts all the time, simply to improve the representative system, but a uh, political system. But on the private area, in a world of relatively stable prices, Indexation would be a nuisance and would just complicate things, and I am not in favor of it under those circumstances. Can I raise a question? That, question? No, no, let me raise audience. one yeah, quick question. That, question. Let me raise one quick question that stems out of that. Why should Mr. Rich Man in the 50 to 70 percent tax bracket, who spends a very low percentage of his income, relatively speaking, on the items in the market basket of the cost of living, get the same adjustment as the man? Who, uh, which your uh, income tax adjustment would do as the man who is right at the lowest income tax bracket of, say, 14% and spends 40% spends of his income on food. As Alfred Marshall said in 1887, a perfect index number, a perfect index adjustment is not only uh, uh, difficult to achieve, it is inconceivable. The right. answer to your question is there is no reason why he should. The answer to your question is that we are talking about a crude painkiller or corrective for a very major and serious problem. It is precisely for this kind of reason that in a world 
in which you are dealing with inflation rates fluctuating around 1, 2, or 3 percent. It is not clear that you could improve matters by any widespread use of indexation, but that's not the kind of world we're talking about. We're talking about a world in which rates of inflation have gone up in the United States to 10, 12 percent for a short period, in a country like Japan to over 20 odd percent, in, your, in Britain today to 20 percent. We're talking about a world in which you have very large inflation, and in such a world, even an imperfect and crude adjustment for inflation is better than no adjustment. No. He's, he's are you really arguing that uh, one can get, uh, one can live with this kind of inflation uh, under indexation, or uh, are you arguing that it is easier to uh, reduce it to small size? Both. The, well, uh, now, if you argue that it's uh, possible to live with that kind of inflation for a long time, uh, then uh, I think uh, uh, that is a very unconvincing argument, because I think that that inflation uh, would continue to accelerate. It's an accelerating inflation, which we now have. It's an accelerating inflation. You talk about an unanticipated inflation, and that is by its very nature uh, uh, an accelerating inflation. Not at all. Yes, I think so. It may and be a variable rate, sometimes 12, sometimes 6. Well, now, here is, look, look, we must not talk about this in the abstract. There is enormous empirical evidence on these questions. Here we've had Chile, which long before its recent unpleasantness, had 100 years of inflation at rates that varied up to 25, 30, 40 percent a year and back down again without any acceleration in the sense of, of, of explosion. Well, Here we've that had may not have been unanticipated either. We have no... Uh, well, the average was, unanti was not unanticipated, but the amount each year was to that some I would extent... Not call unanticipated. That I would call a standard deviation along the expected rate. Yeah, but that what, is something other what than we're talking right. about yeah. here, what we're talking about here fundamentally is the trust or lack of trust in the monetary authority, the Federal Reserve Board in the United States, and its ability to keep the growth of money at a reasonably stable level. All of us would agree that if it allows an explosive growth of money, we'll have an explosive inflation. But that is a separate logical issue from the issue of indexing. It sure as, is. As long as the Federal Reserve... That's exactly maintains... my point. And if you can't put your trust in the Fed without, in, without indexing, why do you think you can put your trust in them with indexing when it's easier to love with? Because indexing makes it easier for them to be responsible. I trust... I trust a man to do a job properly, the easier that job is to That's do. Exactly. That is, uh, let's admit, that is an argument. Sure. That is an sure. argument. And but he gets there is also letters. an argument on the other side of uh, that uh, issue. And the argument just... on the other side of the issue is that it takes more of the vicious act to get the result, so more of it will be forthcoming. Right. You are, you are generalizing from a case in Hungary, in Germany, in Austria after uh, World War II and I, which I think is a case of a qualitatively different kind. Yes, it's possible. Than if you vote with Dr. Fellner and me, Mr. Shanahan, we got him three to two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a moderator. Don't you okay. think you want to go back to the audience? <laughs> yes, um, although they seem to be no, going to listen. Who yes, wants to would you stand and let them find a mic, please? And uh, uh, another, excuse me, just as a bit of methodology, the sort of the next person be rising, uh, so Mike can get to them. Yes. Ed Fulner, the Republican Steering Committee in the House of Representatives. Professor Friedman, in recent newspaper articles, you've been uh, accused or credited with looking very closely at the Brazilian case as uh, the model to follow, yet the Brazilian case seems to be different in uh, very basic respects, such as how much the government is going to force different sectors of the economy to... Uh, engage in indexation. Would you care to comment on that? I'm delighted to comment on that. I have been preaching indexation for several years, but got no attention until I happened by accident to use the Brazilian case as an illustration. And ever since, mm -hmm. I've had Brazil draped around my neck mm -hmm. as if I were a protector of the Brazil. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the Brazilian experience is fascinating and interesting. I think it is an excellent illustration of the virtues and values of indexation. But Brazil is a country very different from ours. And if all the evidence we had was from Brazil, it would seem to me to be a very inadequate basis upon which to judge what ought to be done in the United States. Brazil is an authoritarian country, and it engages in indexing on a scale and in a method that I would not approve for the United States. So I am delighted to respond to this question. I think we should take the evidence not simply from Brazil, but from such countries as Finland, Netherlands, Canada, uh, Israel, a very large number of countries have had experience with this. 
But the thing that fascinated me when I was in Brazil about the Brazilian experience was how closely what they did paralleled in detail what had been recommended in 1886 by Alfred Marshall, although I am sure the Brazilian people had never read Alfred Marshall's uh, uh, paper. Yes, sir. Oh. Arthur Carroll, Office of Senator Brock. Is there any disagreement among the four of you that once you, hopefully we will get some deceleration in the inflation, and that once that occurs, unemployment will not be as bad if you have indexing? Is there any disagreement on that? That's right. And why don't we work through a little bit more specifically? Don't say that's right for me. I won't think that. All right. I, I would accept that, please. I, I would. Ex I would like to say I would accept that. At least three yeah. of the four. Yeah, times. I think yeah. so. Yeah. yeah. I think that that might be postponed under indexation. I give you a chance. But let's yeah. more com uncomfortable. The measures that are needed for that deceleration, and in future phases in which it starts flaring up, it would become worse under indexation. And I don't know how you can weigh these uh, pros and cons against one another. It's going to spread anyway. It will have some favorable, some unfavorable consequences. The answer to the question which you asked is yes, so far as I'm concerned. But there are easier ways to ameliorate the social and political costs of the unemployment problem in our democracy than indexing, in my view. You name 14. Don't, they, uh, yes. don't those all involve government outlays and excess of which you cite as a major cost of inflation? They well, could involve government outlays, but outlays that would be very much recovered in terms of the f benefit resulting from, uh, now for example, I do not look upon a special exemption to the minimum wage for teenagers as an increase in government outlays, which I think is a very important thing in the manpower picture. Manpower training, according to the studies done at this institute and other places, could be as effectively or more effectively done at less cost than has been the case over the past 10 or 12 years. Let's call it worker training. Worker when training, anybody, uh, 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 worker person training, whatever you want to call when it. When anybody tells me that any government venture can be done at less cost more efficiently, I agree with them. When he tells me that that's an easy solution, that's yeah. another story. Well, no, no, this is a very serious problem, whether we can reduce the social costs and political costs of unemployment or not. What could be not easier? Be tossed off easy. What could be an easier solution than reducing the amount of unemployment? That's this gets back to the questioner. Let's ask, how would indexing reduce the amount of unemployment? At the moment, we are in the process of a uh, period during which unemployment is going to rise because the workers are now just becoming compensated for the inflation which has already occurred. We're going to have large wage increases over the next year, which is going to eat up all the spending, and there isn't going to be anything left over for real output, for real spending, and so unemployment is going to increase. This would all be behind us now if we'd had indexing. This would have made the economy more stable. It would have prevented the expansion in spending that had occurred in the last year it would have made things easier for us from now on. The big problem is the delay in the adjustment that workers pay takes to the increase in prices. And so what we have coming up now is a delayed reaction to the inflation in oil and food prices and other prices, and this is going to create un unemployment. If this adjustment were behind us, we would be able to have the same amount of spending, less unemployment, and more real output. Let me pose you a question in this respect. Let us suppose that in the next six months, one, we have indexing starting tomorrow in all of its great glory. Number two, we have an exogenous force from overseas that as a result doubles the cost of imports to us that we just got to have. I mean, uh, some imports that uh -huh. in the short run, in the short run, not in the long run, in the short run in terms of energy and manganese and all these other things we've, we have just got to have. Must we not, under those circumstances, with indexation and an impact on the price level directly in the United States because of the cost of the in increase in cost of those imports, have an increase in the domestic price level that is validated by monetary and fiscal policy or an increase in unemployment, no. even, no. even no. with indexation? No. You're just suggesting a replay of the last six months in which we had an increase in the price of oil, the supposedly yeah, essential commodity, which consumers learned how to do without to a, to a somewhat smaller extent. But this doesn't have to be validated by monetary policy. Well, take something you can't do without, like coffee. <laughs> <laughs> 
If ten dollars a pound, I'll do without coffee. Uh, you're getting us into an area that I really think is outside this, but the main fallacy uh, of this view <coughs> is the same as the fallacy of the view that, <coughs> that Ms. Shanahan was expressing before. You have to distinguish relative prices from absolute prices and from the average level of prices. If the price of oil and uh, fuel as it did uh, and food went up, that meant mm -hmm. consumers had less to spend on other things and meant other prices went up less. You mustn't confuse the arithmetic of a price inflation with the economics of a price inflation. I do and not. I agree with you 100% that if Heller and the others are wrong in saying that exogenous forces can give you a, a eternal inflation under indexing, not unless That's the total right. spending That's is there to validate. Right. Exactly. I agree. And we are also agreeing on something else, more or less, namely that the tax structure uh, leads to very, very undesirable results if there is a sustained inflationary development. The exemption limits get to be uh, very different than had been uh, planned. Tax brackets get to be ill-defined. Capital gains are defined in a way that is not uh, really uh, applicable to uh, uh, economic uh, processes because uh, uh, money gain can be a real loss easily, and yeah. many of them are. And the depreciation allowances become quite inadequate. You can't replace it. So there is agreement, perhaps, on that too, isn't there? There's a man back there who's waiting for you. Yes. Uh, David out Clark University. The discussion was left earlier at a point which I think was very critical. I think the panelists really admitted it was critical and then said we can't, we can't hear you. The discussion was left earlier at a point which it seemed to me was very critical and the panel agreed it was very critical and then said simply uh, the last comment I believe was there's nothing we can do about it and we've gone on since then without ever coming back to it. And that's the transitional problem. If, if you have huge amounts of prior contractual obligations outstanding what do you do? How do you go to indexing? If you do go to indexing and the monetary authorities go wrong, the indexing will exacerbate this situation for these particular industries. This raises another question. If you can get through the transitional period, why would you say you shouldn't index all the time? Because if you don't index all the time, then any time you hit an inflation, you'll have this block of contractual obligations sitting there that you're going to have to get around somehow. <clears throat> Would you, I agree on the contractual obligation. There's 600 billion bucks or so in savings accounts in commercial banks, savings banks, savings and loans, and I don't know how many in uh, cash value loans on, on life insurance. And if the Treasury tomorrow issues a purchasing power bond at even 3% plus the cost of living, I see a tremendous increase in disintermediation, which is already a priority number one problem in our society. That I don't is see the, answer. the most incomprehensible of all economist words. It means people taking their money out of mainly savings and loans, but also banks because they can get a higher interest elsewhere. And there's general agreement that this is pretty terrible, mostly because it takes away the money for financing housing. Yeah. Yeah. And this general, would make it more so. Uh, no, it will not. The general answer to this sure basic will. question is that the problem of the savings and loan and thrift institutions is a basic and serious problem. It's a problem that's with us now, and it's a problem that indexing or no indexing will not be avoided except by a rapid decline in the rate of inflation. But indexing if will indexing, make it worse. If I beg your pardon. Indexing will simply unveil what is there and what is already bad and going to get bad re worse if inflation speeds up. If inflation slows down, this problem will also slow down. Now. The crucial question then is, are we better off, post, in order to hoping that we can postpone the evil day, to, conti to continue inflating without indexing in the hope that we won't unveil, that we won't pull the veil off this mess, this ungodly situation in which the savings and loan and thrift institutions are, and then have a still bigger mess later on? Or are we better facing up to it right now, improving our arrangements in such a way that if we succeed, in slowing down inflation. Indexing will help us do that, enable us to do it more rapidly, and therefore get out of this situation more rapidly. If we don't, if we inflate with indexing, well then we just have to face up to the thrift institutions, but indexing then provides us a way to face up to the thrift institutions that can be transitory and not permanent. Because indexing will then provide us a way to make 
any bailout of the thrift institutions, and I am afraid politically a bailout will be necessary, contingent upon their restructuring their assets and their new assets and their new liabilities so you can gradually eliminate this necessity of shoring them up. Now, if you don't index, what are you going to do? Are you going to shore up these savings alone and thrift institutions permanently? Are you going to pour billions of money into supporting the mortgage money rate, the mortgages that these institutions have outstanding? Are you going to force, uh, keep regulation Q on indefinitely? I think that the fundamental answer to the question, which the very important question which Mr. Ott raises, is that you're facing an extremely difficult and serious problem, and the sooner you face up to it and bring it out into the open and, and do something about it, the better, and don't kid yourself into thinking that you can reduce the problem by avoiding indexation. But you you're going on the assumption the way that we are... Congress on that, uh, Mr. Friedman. There's a <coughs> administration-sponsored bill before oh, the, Congress. the Hunt Commission recommendation, sure. But yes, you're so going on... Uh, uh, Congress isn't doing anything about it. Well, well, Congress is going to do... That is a restructuring of the... the yes, I know. Well. Congress I know. is going to do something about and it. And the lines which you suggest. But it's a long-run so solution, not a short-run well, solution. Well, three but you're years. Going on the, you're go uh, a lot longer than three years. Three, well, three but years. you're going on the assumption that without indexation or indexing, we're going to let inflation run rampant. And you conclude in your article in Fortune that despite the experience of the last 40 years when Hoover was defeated because of unemployment and Nixon in 60 was defeated because of unemployment, inflation is now a number one political issue and it is causing governments to fall in England and perhaps in Japan and perhaps in other places. This I encourages me to the conclusion that there is a middle course without indexing that can reduce inflation and you can work your way through the shoals of this disintermediation withdrawal of funds from the savings institutions without what you say is a temporary transitional problem that I think would just knock the financial system but right on its rear. I think, uh, I agree, I think our leaders are behind the public. I think the public at large is willing to take sterner measures against inflation then yes. our leaders recognize that they have got a cultural lag. And yet, mm -hmm. I fear, as I look at our past efforts to stop inflation, that while I don't, I'm not one of those who predicts that we're going to have a runaway inflation, that we're going to repeat the German experience. We're not. Mm -hmm. That isn't what's in store. But I think that right now you've already come to a situation in which the, everybody would heave a sigh of relief if inflation came down to 6%. It was 4.5% when, in desperation, supposedly, Mr. Nixon imposed price and wage controls in 1971. So you don't have to have inflation run rampant to expect that the chances of 10% per year over the next 10 or 15 years are not very small. Another question? Uh, Frank Schiff, Committee for Economic Development. Uh, I wonder if all the panelists agree to the assumption that seems to have been made that when there are external impulses on the economy, uh, that either raise or lower prices, that the economy reacts as quickly to both sides, uh, or whether one hasn't had some experience that it's harder, it's easier for prices to stay up or to be raised than, and, and wages at some point, than to lower them. If that's the case, then the kind of example that Charlie Walker gave earlier of a sudden rise of external prices that may be quite temporary, with indexation, uh, could uh, give rise to building a long-term increase in other prices and wages to, into the economy, uh, and you would not necessarily get the same effect on the downside in practice in the way our institutions work. And I wonder if anyone would like to comment on that. Well, I think you put your finger on one of the most, most important arguments for indexing. We do have an asymmetry now. It is easier for prices and wages to go up than to go down. When spending declines in the economy, the first reaction of an employer is not to cut the wages of his employees, it's to lay them off and cause unemployment. Now, the argument for indexing is that it makes the upside of increasing inflation symmetric with the downside of decreasing inflation. We have escalators or index clauses written into wage agreements, which makes it just as easy for a fortuitous increase in the price of oil to raise wages as for a decreasing gain in the price of oil to reduce wages. This we do not now have. It's the reason why it's so hard to stop inflation and why the price in terms of unemployment is so high. But I want to, uh, I go part way, but not all the way with that. I would go more directly in answer to Schiff's question. 
that first, note that what's often involved is not some prices falling and other prices rising, but some prices rising less rapidly than they otherwise would, so that the asymmetry is rather less marked than he would suppose. You're not starting out with a zero inflation. You're starting out in a world in which you already had a six or seven or eight percent built-in inflation, and the question is, if some prices rise more rapidly, isn't it perfectly possible for other prices to rise less rapidly? In the second place, as we've seen in farm prices in the last few months, declining prices are not completely ruled out of our society. I think it's easy to exaggerate the asymmetry in commodity and price and, and, and product markets, that there is a strong asymmetry in the labor market. Uh, I would grant much more readily, but I believe it's easy to exaggerate how much of an asymmetry there is in the product and, and, and service markets. Is there another question from the audience? If not, I think maybe the... Yes. <laughs> Uh, Walter Salant, the Brookings Institution. Uh, uh, <clears throat> if they were dropped in 1961, I presume that was because the cost of living stopped going up. But your uh, proposal that, uh, and your objective of making uh, the decline work out better from the point of view of real output and helping wages to go down when the consumer price index goes down, requires that the wage escalation be kept uh, when the consumer price level goes down. But the experience you've just cited suggests that it will be dropped then, that it's only accepted by unions as a protection against increases. If you're not going to require it by the government, then you have to get both parties to the private bargain to accept it. Well, there are two parties. And I don't see how you can reconcile your position with the fact that you've just cited. There are two parties to every contract. There are businessmen and there are workers. And when we have an accelerating period of inflation and the escalation clauses are built into the contracts, obviously the businessmen are going to want to get out of it and the labor unions are going to want to keep it. On the downside, the businessmen are going to love them and the labor unions are going to want to get out. Now that will be a matter of negotiation. I don't see any way of predicting before the fact which way it's going to work out. Your conclusion in advance of any kind of argument assumes that the union is the more powerful party to the bargain and that the union will be able to dictate to the firm that the escalation clause must end the moment the price index starts to fall. I was using your sample of one case. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, just one, it is just one case. I might note as a matter of historical interest that uh, the argument I was citing earlier of Alfred Marshall in favor of indexation came not during a period of inflation, but during a period of deflation. He was arguing for it primarily as a way of reducing the harm done in Britain, this was in Britain in 1886, from the deflation that was then going on. So that I think the argument does work both ways. That what you have to say is that indexation has great virtues in any situation where there are unanticipated changes in degree, either up or down. And I believe, contrary to what, uh, to some extent, to what Bob Gordon just said, that, even, that uh, there is a common interest of employers and employees on both sides of the picture. That an employer has an interest in having an escalator clause during an inflation as a way of avoiding a growing discontent among his workers which will cause a very serious labor disruption at the termination of a contract, and that the union and the workers have a great incentive to have an escalator clause during a decline in prices as a way of avoiding the unemployment which would otherwise be caused by rigid prices if they insisted on having no adjustment, I mean rigid wages, if they insisted on having no adjustment. So I think there really is a, con there really is a, uh, a concordance of interest. And I wouldn't take this one case as a, as a typical example. No, and I think that's a nice way of summarizing one of the basic arguments for indexing. If we talk about what the small man, the ordinary person, has to gain from this, actually he gains on both sides. He gains on the way up because the harm done by an inflationary surprise, as in the case of oil, is not going to be as great. And he gains on the way down because the recession is not going to be as long and the layoffs and the unemployment are not going to be as bad. So in this sense, it's a way of stabilizing the economy and reducing the impact on the ordinary person of these surprises that we're not going to be able to prevent and rule out. 
If he I, gains every which way, who loses? No one. That's game. It's the best game in town. That's what the free market is, isn't it? <laughs> not the in free the market sense. is a game under which everybody gains. Not in the sense of the wage bargain, the way Dr. Garden described it. I'd agree more with him than I would agree with you, because what you described as the self-interest of the worker was a self-interest in your own image that I'm sure that the work not sure that the worker or the union would see as a self-interest because the degree of unemployment involved might be a very low percentage of union workers and they're much more interested in keeping wage rates up than they are in preventing unemployment from rising one or two points. Gentlemen, I won't ask it's, the, oh, go ahead, Dr. Feller. They won't ask Dr. Gordon the obvious question, what sort of wage bargaining process would have led to the voluntary acceptance of those real wage grains, gains which were available in the midst of the oil crisis. The worker has got a bad deal. And but, but do you the, think you could have agreed with them on uh, sort of declining real wage rates? What we have now is a situation in which the ordinary working person has had an unprecedented decline in his real income in the last year. Yes. And he is going to get back by demanding unusually large increases in his wages over the next year. Well, look, he's had a decline, and now he's going to have an increase, and we'll be back to where we started he after will, a great deal. He will demand the oil that wasn't here? That's what you are really saying. Uh, well, that will never lead to equilibrium of any sort, right. if he insists on that. He'll I demand more maybe, money income. <laughs> I think maybe the time has come to note that most unsatisfactory of all conclusions that uh, we've agreed to disagree. Uh, but <laughs> I, for one, have agreed to agree. I, I think I'm Don't underestimate agree. the amount of agreement there is. I agree with that. <laughs> On the other side, no, that's, that's quite true. But don't overestimate the amount of agreement that you have. <laughs> I agree with that too. Okay. Then I, I for one feel. And don't uh, underestimate the inspiration we got from Milton Friedman. I'll prove all that. I, I for one, certainly, uh, I feel a little wiser than when I walked in here. And I wish to thank my truly distinguished panel, Dr. Milton Friedman of the University of Chicago, Dr. William Fellner of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, Dr. Charles Walker, formerly of the Treasury, now a private economic consultant, and Dr. Robert Gordon of Northwestern University. This roundtable discussion has brought you the views of four knowledgeable experts who have differing opinions on the value of fighting inflation by tying the country's economic movement to cost of living indicators. It is the aim of the American Enterprise Institute to illuminate issues of the day by presenting many such views in the hope that by so doing, those in decision-making positions will benefit from such a free exchange of informed and enlightened opinion. I'm Peter Hackes in Washington. Washington Debates for the 70s is created and supplied to this station as a public service by the American Enterprise Institute, Washington, D.C.